A little while back, I did a Sadler's Quick Takes, it's number three, that had to do with prioritization. And in that video, I promised that I would do another quick take about the topic of being truly well read. So this is that quick take. I'm going to make good on that promise. And I'm going to say right off the bat that nobody is truly well read because there isn't any sort of universal consensus criterion for what that would look like. And not just universally, like across different disciplines, but even in, say, the field that I work in and that the person who was worried about this uh, was uh, talking about, namely philosophy. I mean, look at this bookshelf behind me. I haven't read every single book in this bookshelf. And, you know, some of them might be books that would be good for me, but not necessarily for somebody else. There's inevitably going to be some major gaps in there. And so, you know, we should think about this notion of what it means to be really well read. It doesn't have to do with a bookshelf behind you or some list that you've put together in, say, Goodreads. Uh, I've, I've got a Goodreads and I haven't updated the things that I've actually read or started reading for years and years. So people could have all sorts of mistaken ideas about that. What I want to really address right up front is not just the concept or pseudo-concept of being well-read or we can add the intensifier, truly well-read, I want to address the assumptions and the feelings that go along with this as a concern. I think that, you know, one of the greatest ones or most widespread ones that I see when people express these sorts of interests and concerns and ideals is that of anxiety, they are concerned that there's something that they're falling short of, they're missing out on, and they're, they're not enough. They're not doing enough. They haven't started on the path or process that would get, their, get them to some sort of imagined endpoint where they are genuinely well-read. And we could compare this to other similar worries that people have. You could think about in terms of financial stability, right? You know, the ancients pointed out as part of, you know, being moderately well-read, knowing that this is a common theme in ancient philosophy and indeed not just in philosophy, but in, you know, religious texts and in literature and, and so many other things that you really never can have enough wealth if your goal is to have security through your wealth. As a matter of fact, the more wealth you have, the more conscious you become of how easy it would be to deprive you of it or for it to rot or for, you know, some catastrophe due to fortune to take it all away from you, right? Or for you to die while you've accumulated like a miser, all these stacks of gold coins or something like that. We could also think of it in terms of physical accomplishments. You know, I'm going to build this wonderful, beautiful body that's going to be so buff and, you know, swole and I'll pick all the, you know, you're never going to be enough. And it's, it's the same with books, right? You can keep on reading and you'll never get to the end of your library. And then you can walk into another library and be like, oh man, look at all these shelves full of books that I'll never actually get to. And this does uh, tend to produce a kind of worry, a fear, an anxiety for many people, an anxiety that has to do with several different elements. One is their own self-image, their own self-understanding. Another is whatever it is that they've got locked away up in their head that they've managed to accumulate, and those two are connected with each other. Another of these is what other people are telling them because there's so many, you know, advice givers out there. Oh man, you got to read this book. You got to read this book. Oh, if you haven't read this, you don't know anything about philosophy. 
And most of these people are just, you know, flailing around in the dark themselves and they bought into somebody else's program or they're making it up as they go along. And many of them are just full of crap. You know, you, you don't have to believe them. And then we have the physical artifacts, which not only, you know, exist in libraries and shelves and books that we can hold in our hands, but all these electronic media that you can find online, you know, a lot of the ancient uh, literature that we still have, you can find digitized and available for you. And so, you know, the, it is, it does make sense that people would feel a bit anxious about where they are and how they understand themselves in relation to others who, at least to them and to many others, are held up as like paragons of the well-educated person. You know, I'll, I'll just use an example right here. So, you know, somebody who I personally like and respect quite a bit, Alistair McIntyre, wrote this great book, After Virtue, you know, decades into his career. And it's uh, very important. This is the third edition. It really did. I mean, it didn't radically change virtue ethics or academic philosophy, but it, it did make a big impact. Right. And you look at the stuff that he's talking about in here. And, you know, if you've read the book, you can actually tell that he he knows some areas way better uh, than others and, you know, knows better than me about quite a few things. But there's other things where. He got took he got taken to task by experts, you know, for his take on Kierkegaard. They actually Kierkegaard scholars wrote a whole book uh, trying to rebut him, and then he contributed to it. Uh, Anthony Long, a great uh, scholar of Hellenistic uh, philosophy, wrote about how McIntyre got Stoicism wrong, and we could go on and on and on and on. Everybody has got blind spots. Everybody, even if they've had the opportunity to study philosophy or other things for decades and decades and decades, there's more that they haven't read than that they actually have read. And for all of us, every single one of us, no matter how much time we have to devote to studying philosophy, no matter how much we've accumulated along the way, we are more gaps in an education than a solid education. And anybody who pretends otherwise is either deluded or they're selling you some sort of program or they themselves got you know taught something and they didn't venture out of its narrow confines because they, you know, they they thought that was the fullness of things. And that could be forgiven if we go back like hundreds of years when there just weren't that many texts available, even if you were a conscientious and careful reader belonging to the Republic of Letters that existed in, say, the 17th and 18th and even arguably the 19th century, we've had an explosion. There are more books, more articles, more texts than you could ever possibly read in a lifetime in which all you had to do was read and digest these works. So you don't have to feel as if somehow you have been, you know, uniquely missing out and other people are so much better educated than you. Better educated is a completely relative term. Whoever we pick as our ideal to strive after, they, they are also very, you know, imperfect. And if they're honest people, they'll tell you so that they haven't studied all these things. As a matter of fact, McIntyre's a good example of this in his next book in the series. I'm not going to try to reach for it because I, I would have to go off camera a little bit. Who's justice, which rationality? He says, you know, I'm going beyond after virtue in this, and I'm going to talk about this, and I'm going to talk about that. And I know that I also could have talked about this and that, but I just didn't get to it, or I'm not competent to do it. And then there's all sorts of other things that I can be at least conscious that I've, I've left out. So you don't have to try to strive after some sort of illusory ideal of being truly well-read, even just being well-read. You know, you could revise this. And here's my suggestion for those who 
are laboring under this, this misconception and who are making themselves feel bad as a result. Don't worry so much about whether you're well read or not. Be concerned with making small bits of progress, finding texts that you can be relatively confident that you're going to get something out of and start reading them. So, you know, great example. People are always, where should I start in philosophy? And I always say, Plato's dialogues. And they're like, oh, well, which ones must I read and in what order? And I'm like, you don't have to be so concerned about that. I mean, here, I, I actually do have some suggestions for which ones would be best to start out with. But you don't have to read every single one. I mean, you're not going to get everything out of the text the first, the second, the tenth time anyway. You're going to be reading and rereading and going back and forth and maybe stop reading Plato for a while and you go on to Aristotle or you jump to Rene Descartes or you, you know, read some 20th and 21st century texts about Plato or pick whatever you want. You can always come back to it and you may not be particularly ready for one, you know, text or author at this point in time, that's okay. You got your life ahead of you. You can come back to them. If you read Nietzsche and you're like, I, I don't, I don't see what everybody says is so great about this person. Odds are you've probably missed something, right? Uh, but the good news is you, you can read the book again. <laughs> you can come back to it five years later. You can do all sorts of things along those lines. And so put the stress instead on what are you reading now? What are you going to take on? And, you know, what are you slowly accumulating for yourself? You don't have to try to read everything. You couldn't possibly do so anyway. And you don't have to worry about comparing yourself with others who, you know, are being held up as paragons of being well-read or even uh, presenting themselves as being well-read to make you, you know, feel a little bit bad. Most of those people uh, are not particularly well-read. You know, if, when you look at the field of people talking to each other about philosophy, and this, this pertains just as much to academic philosophy as it does to the popular world that the internet has opened up where people jockey for position and, you know, kind of posture and uh, present themselves as being, you know, being a better reader than they actually are. That happens all the time in academic philosophy as well. Um, you, you really don't know whether somebody truly understands a particular philosopher or text or something like that, unless you've got some background yourself and you can judge. And these are always probabilistic judgments. They're not perfect deductions or anything like that. And the good news is you don't actually have to worry about any of that if you just want to make some progress for yourself. You should measure your degree of being, if you want to use the term well-read, you should measure that against where you were a year ago or where you were five years ago or where you were even just before you read this latest book that you're probably going to have to go back and reread sections of or maybe the whole thing uh, in, in a little while or five years from now or 20 years from now and you'll get more out of it next time around. And that, that is perfectly okay. So, I mean, you don't actually need my permission or my approval or anything like that in order to throw away this term well-read or uh, truly well-read. But if that helps you at all, saying, well, Dr. Sadler said that I don't have to be so concerned with that, then that's, that's cool. Great. I'll, I'll give that to you. But you, you, you don't need that. You can, you can just go on and read the text that you're going to do and make an honest effort at it. And over time, I can promise you, if you stick to it, things are going to accumulate. And over the process of reading and rereading, you, you never become truly well-read or anything like that, but you get to know the, the field that you're in. And if you only know portions of it, that's fine. That's still something really good. You're getting exposed to some of the finest thinkers 
you know, available to us as part of our wonderful heritage as human beings. And you get to be in this, this uh, long conversation, which you don't have to hear every bit of. So that's what I have to say about that. Hopefully these are some encouraging words for people. There's no uh, you know, intention here of tearing anything down. I just want to like remove some obstacles, primarily affective ones, uh, stemming from assumptions that people have so that they can live a better life as readers of philosophy and of literature more broadly.